As we look back on our Lenten practices, you may want to think about how you did. Some areas might have done well, and some other areas not quite so well. Well, if spiritual reading was something you tried this Lent and failed at, don't worry. Be happy. Life is hectic and our Lord is merciful. And we've got a plan to help you tonight to do some more spiritual reading, so please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle and welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight has had all the time in the world to do spiritual reading. I mean, she's a wife, she's a homeschooling mom of six children, from 18 down to six. <laughs> Who are we kidding? Of course she didn't have much time. She could hardly find time to sit down, get alone, read a book in a quiet spot. But she knew that she had to get closer to our Lord, and she had to be purposeful about her spiritual growth and understanding, which is why she started a book club and created her own spiritual reading program in the form of her new book called How to Read Your Way to Heaven, a spiritual reading program for the worst of sinners and the greatest of saints and everyone in between. So please welcome tonight's guest, Mrs. Vicki Borbach. How are you? Good, how are you, Father? Thanks for having me. Now, where are you coming from? Yeah. <laughs> when to, um, when came down here, where you, where, where's home for you? Um, I'm from uh, Elkhorn, Nebraska, which is yeah. just west Omaha, okay. basically. Good, uh -huh. good, good to have you here. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Probably a little bit warmer. But probably not too much. A little warmer here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not too bad there, but. No, no. It's, it's a nice spring. And so, uh, how did you get started doing this reading program? I mean, y you are very busy. Yeah, you well. Know, with, with kids from 18 to 6, six of them. Yeah. And, you know, you're homeschooling. So it's not like you're, they go off to school and you sit around eating bonbons no, all day. No. So uh, why did you do this kind of program? Well, I actually put the reading program together. It's been probably 10 years ago now, okay. and I've been using it. Okay. And I came up with it as a solution to a problem because was? I was very busy. Yeah. And I felt that you know, my spiritual growth was very important. And I was a convert. So I wanted to make sure that I was growing in my faith and you know, understanding it. And I was randomly reading things here, there, and yonder. And I, I was an avid reader, but I felt there wasn't really much rhyme and reason to it. Mm -hmm. And as a homeschooling mom, if it wasn't on the checklist, it didn't get done. Yeah. And I felt like we had order in our homeschool situation. And I wanted to bring order to my spiritual life. So you know, over time, after many years of reading voraciously, you know, I started out with Scott Hahn, I went to Peter Kraft, and I you know, read Henry Graham and many other, many other authors, and I realized I was really gaining a lot of head knowledge and not a lot of heart knowledge. And I was very stressed still about trying to make sure we were doing everything right. And, I, you know, as a convert, I came very new to understanding the faith. What did you convert from? I would say nothing, really. I mean, my, mm -hmm. yeah. my mother was a Methodist. My father was a Catholic, but I didn't know that until I was an adult. Um, so perhaps when they got married, they So he didn't give you a lot nothing. of evidence right. of his Catholicism. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, there was a time I wasn't sure there was a God. You know, I was in college. and. Mm -hmm. um, Did your parents talk much about their faith? No, I mean, I, I knew my mom believed in God. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew my parents were divorced, and... I mostly grew up with my mom, but I knew that um, I knew she believed in God. My father probably did. You know, I, we didn't really talk a lot about it. Um, but you know, I I felt like there was something out there, 
and I wasn't sure what it was. And uh, you know, I had this experience in college where I was uh, I was a political science major, and I had an atheist professor who proceeded one day to. That's no surprise. Oh, we'll yeah. go on. He told us all about how Christianity was invented to suppress the poor, <laughs> and you know, he gave us all kinds of stuff. And you know, I'm sitting there as someone very uneducated in any faith thinking it was plausible. You know, I mm -hmm. thought, well, that makes sense. You know, he's the guy with the PhD. He knows what he's talking about. And so for about two seconds, I contemplated atheism. I mean, I really I was listening to him, and he made a lot of sense. And two students in the center of class would raise their hand, and they would question the things he said. And they were very respectful, and I don't know what, to did this he, day. And did he tolerate being questioned? Yes, but his his arguments fell apart. I mean, he really didn't okay, have good. much past his talking points. Mm -hmm. Because when they asked articulate questions, he really didn't have much for an answer. And I don't really remember what they asked. I, didn't even, I don't even know to this day whether they knew each other. But they were two students who would just ask, what about this and what about that? And the biggest thing I remember from that day is that those two students knew. They knew something for sure. They weren't one of these people sitting here thinking, you know, he could be right or he could be wrong. And, and I felt like if there's a God, I want to know it like they know it. Mm -hmm. And they were very confident. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so years later, when I did join the church, I found like, you know, I, fo I found the truth and I was so excited about it. And one of the things I wanted to make sure was that I knew it and that my children knew it. I wanted them to know their faith and to love mm -hmm. God and know who he was. And so I felt as someone who came from a non-Catholic background, I really needed to understand, you know, the faith. So, um, so I did a lot of reading. And this, this came, this was 10 years ago, but it was about 10 years into my experience with the church. Mm -hmm. So I spent 10 years reading, and I would say reading from the mind, which can be cold and sterile. You know, I spent a lot of time debating family and friends who were not Catholic and really trying to beat the truth into them, you know, things like that. Yeah. And, and I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one time I walked into a, a store in Chicago, a Catholic bookstore, and on every end cap there were two books. And little did I know this was just a few weeks before St. Gianna Beretta Mala was to be canonized. And I walked in there, and one book was her biography, and one was a book called Love Letters to My Husband. That was the first book I ever read by a saint or about a saint. Uh, I had read a lot of theological books, which definitely told me, you know, how to practice the faith and how to, you know, the truths about God. But I hadn't, I don't think I'd really experienced him, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So... These two books were on every end cap, and I picked one up, and the love letters to her husband, at the time I had three children, three and under, and my husband traveled all the time. And I look at this book, and here she was a doctor, and I started reading, uh, just standing in the bookstore, and the letters were... St. John Amala was the doctor. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And the letters were beautiful. I mean, just, you could tell that she saw in their marriage that they were one you could tell that she saw that they were all a family with a mission together for heaven. She was very concerned about him on his travels. And, and at the time, it was a very different feeling than I gave my husband, who would travel probably you know, at least a week, a month. Mm -hmm. And I felt like uh, you know, here he gets to go stay in a hotel room, and I have the kids 24 hours a day, and very much the culture supported me on my mindset. You know, here I had given up my career and I had stayed home with my kids and by my own choice. You know, it wasn't his choice. I really wanted to. But there was always this, this friction. And it felt like the culture says you need a career, that you're not valuable if you don't have one. And here I was raising my kids and on one half of me very excited and the other half of me feeling like he was the lucky one. You know, he gets to enjoy the kids but also go out and have a career. And as I read that book, it was, it was a profound realization that, no, I can choose. I can choose my family, and I can choose for us to be one unit, and I can reject what the culture says. And it was my first experience with really seeing how God can work in 
the hearts and minds of, of, of saints. Mm -hmm. And so then I started pursuing more spiritual reading from the saints and realized that really what I wanted to do was grow in holiness. That it was about getting to heaven and growing in holiness, not just about knowledge. And that was the point at which I um, realized I really wanted to, um, to dig into the, the catechism and sacred scripture in a more meditative way. You know, so before that, I would pick up a spiritual reading book and I'd read it and I'd be all excited. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to carry out the things, the truths that I learned. And then I would put it down and pick up another book and I'd lose whatever I had from that book. You know, I'd read one on prayer. Okay, I'm going to take these steps and implement them in my life. And then I would move on to something about, um, you know, something about the papacy. And I'd read that and I'd lose unintentionally all the things I'd read before. So... Uh, someone handed me Father C. John McCloskey's Lifetime Catholic Reading List. And one of the books I had always wanted to read was the Catechism, and I would pick it up and begin reading just a couple paragraphs, and it was so profound. Not challenging, not hard to read, but just there was so much in every paragraph mm -hmm. that I could just read a couple of paragraphs a day. So I, I oftentimes, with Scripture... And with the catechism, I oftentimes compare it to being like eating, uh, you know, really good Belgian chocolate. That's what I said. Is yeah, that it's chocolate that for it's, the soul. It, yeah. It's very uh, you, you savor it. Yeah. You know, a Hershey bar you can just pop in. Yep. But this you savor because it's so special. Absolutely, absolutely, and that was my feeling. So, um, wanting to read the catechism, I would pick it up and read, you know, just a hundred pages. And I'd read a little bit every day, but I'd get impatient. And I'd think, I'm never going to finish this. And I'd set it down and then go to the next spiritual reading book. And I did the same thing with sacred scripture. I'd read it for a while, and I'd get to Leviticus, and I'd feel like this, has, you know, this is not meaningful to me, and I need to go pick up a, another spiritual reading book. So when someone handed me Father C. John McCloskey's Lifetime Catholic Reading List, I realized that almost all the spiritual reading books we read coincide with the four pillars of the faith as laid out in the catechism. So the catechism is broken into four parts, as you know. The first is our profession of faith, what we believe. You know, and it takes the creed right. line by line and develops it quite a bit yeah. so that you understand fully what the creed is about. Absolutely. And the second is the celebration of the Christian mystery. You know, so we really go into depth understanding the sacraments and the liturgy. And the third section um, is life in Christ. You know, what does it mean to actually walk as a Christian, to walk in Christ's footsteps? And the fourth is prayer. And I decided if I took the, these books on this list and I organized them according to the section of the catechism, I could read each day a little bit of one of these books and a little bit of the catechism and a little bit of sacred scripture. And I could do what I had been wanting to do and focus on you know, just one section of the catechism, say, for a year. And the way I came up with that idea of a year is, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been very interested in Ben Franklin's notion of pursuing. He was very organized, and he would focus on one virtue every week. And he had 14 or 16 virtues, and he would recycle and go through. So, he, so say this was his week to work on um, cleanliness. You know, he would make sure he read something on cleanliness. He would journal about cleanliness and he would simplify his life so that he could practice that in a much more um, real, you know, a much more filling, fulfilling way. And uh, I was thinking that would be really good with respect to the faith if I really put some focus on one aspect of my faith for an amount of time, it would allow me to actually put it into practice. You know, so, um, so I did, I laid it out in a five-year program um, and there are four pillars, and you might wonder why it's a five-year program. The first two years are devoted to the profession of faith, to what we believe as Catholics. As a convert, I really felt like I wanted to know, and I've come to feel like a lot of people really need to understand their faith in a much more thorough and manner. It, it, as a matter of fact, I would say that one of the problems in the, the last 50 years has been a, a, a lack of interest in the propositions of the faith, right. the content, the, the, the actual doctrines. And uh, there was even an early catechism um, from Holland called the Dutch Catechism. Mm -hmm. They said, ah, 
The Trinity is kind of hard, so we'll just skip it. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Yeah. That would do a correction later on. Right. Uh, but you don't skip the Trinity. No. Well, you know, uh, Sister Marie Pappas in uh, New York interviewed me for the book, and as she was talking to me, she said, do you know why the, the first section of the catechism is the longest, why the profession of faith is the longest section? And in an interview, I said, no, sister, you tell me. I don't know. And she said, she said, because it is the greatest challenge of our time. And they were wise enough to know that it is, it, we are in a horrible time with respect to faith. Yes. And um, she said, if you look through the history of the catechisms, you will see that the way the catechism was organized reflects the challenges we faced in history. And she said, you go back to the Reformation, the largest section of the catechism was the sacraments because they were being, you know, thrown by the wayside. Right. And, right. and she and said... A lot of the different churches would only have two sacraments. Some had no sacraments. Some had five, you know, so... Right, right. And I that. just, I thought that was amazing to hear. So I hadn't known that. But, but yeah, so I, it's um, important that that be a large, a large focus. And so the first two years you focus on the profession of faith and then in the preceding years, mm -hmm. um, each of the other pillars as okay. well. Well... And this is, um, and, and you lay it out in this book, you know, how to read your way to heaven, um, so that people can, uh, you know, then see this plan mm -hmm. and work their way through it in an organized way. That's, that's a great gift because a lot of folks just don't know where to start. Right, right. It, it works really well for someone who hasn't done a lot of spiritual reading. And, you know, I, I'd say there are two audiences for this book. One, someone who hasn't done a lot and isn't quite sure how to get started. Is it's that the, book the I would, uh, worst of sinners one? That's right. That was me. Yeah, no, no, of course not. Um, but it is the book I would have wanted 20 years ago when I entered the church because yeah. it just lays it out there. And here, you know, you go through the catechism and you go through the beautiful classic. I mean, just great works, good meaty stuff. Um, and you start with Rome Sweet Home by Scott and Kimberly Hahn. Um, and you go into, there's, I have a few books in there by Frank Sheed. You know, you read Theology for Beginners and theology and sanity, and you know, you move on into the sacraments and um, uh, you go from there. But, um, but the, way I, the way I wanted to lay this out was so that you actually could pursue each piece just a little bit every day. You know, so just, you, just 15 minutes a day because we go out into the culture and we are constantly bombarded with things that are antithetical to the faith. You know, and we need to center ourselves on Christ. You know, we need to center ourselves on our faith. And one thing this does, spiritual reading I found, helps you to live the gifts that God's given us in the sacraments, in prayer, and in other ways, in just a much more complete and fulfilling way. So it just builds them up. And I think people underestimate the importance of taking on a task and day by day, just go ahead and do it. Right. Um, I remember when uh, I was preparing for final vows, there was, there, there is a uh, biography of St. Francis Xavier. Mm -hmm. It's four volumes, about 12 to 1500 pages per volume. <laughs> it was big. All right, right. And a lot of, a lot of I said, oh, I'll never read that. But I said, no, I can do that. You know, in this year preparation, I'll just read a little bit every day. And I finished the whole thing. Yeah. I had time to go and do some other biographies right, that were right. big. You know, <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is one of the things that you can do if you are willing to take one piece of, at a time. Right. You don't shove a whole steak down your throat. Right. Cut it into bite-sized pieces. Absolutely. And, you know, you just, if, if you have 15 minutes even, you know, 15 to 30 minutes a day is what I say. But, you know, say you start with 15 minutes, you begin, you take your time. I mean, I personally, I set a timer because we are on a busy schedule. So I'll set a timer for 30 minutes. When sure. I do it, my kid, that's after breakfast, my kids are getting dressed, ready for school, doing their chores. And, you know, and I can do that now because my youngest is six. I'm, I'm sure when they were little, I couldn't do that. But, no, no, they um, need a little more help. Yeah, dressed. then I would do it at night. <laughs> um, I couldn't do it in the morning. But, you know, I'll set the timer and I will read it. And when that 30 minutes are up, Say I took extra time to meditate on sacred scripture. Say all I got done that day was a chapter of sacred scripture and a couple paragraphs of the catechism. Then the following day I could follow up with, with the rest of the assignment. You know, so, yeah. so it's a five-year program, but it's really 
There are no dates. There, it could be a 10-year program. It's just about uniting ourselves with Christ every day. And getting some spiritual nourishment Absolutely. that nourishes the mind. It yeah. is important right. to nourish the mind right. and help it think. You know, a lot of people uh, have a, a, a notion that uh, the conscience is how you feel about things. Yeah, yeah. Your conscience needs to be formed, formed mm -hmm. and directed to think clearly. And you also need that spiritual uh, growth and nourishment that does nourish the heart as well as the mind. Absolutely. Both, the, you know, your whole person yeah, yeah. needs to grow. Absolutely. Well, Frank Sheed said, you know, um, knowledge is food, um, truth is food. And, you know, he talks about, he says in Theology for Beginners, he says, you know, the interesting thing about food is that I can't be nourished by food that you eat. I have to, you know, eat it myself. Yeah. And he talks about, you know, we must have an understanding of the faith. We have to have that knowledge. We have to be able to explain, you know, all of the dogmas of the faith because there are so many people out there who are starving and we need to be able to help yeah. you know, to feed them. And uh, it's worth thinking that yeah, some of it is hard to understand. Some of it takes a little bit more thinking than other books. Mm -hmm. But there's a, you know, there are a number of birds and such where the mother bird goes and digests the food and then spits it up. Right. Now, you know, it's fish, especially right. they do with fish. Right. Um, you don't need to do that. Uh, you know, go ahead and start chewing on your own. Right. You know, get, you know, masticate your own food, <laughs> you know, and, and get into even things that are a little bit challenging, right. but that's okay. Right. You know, and even if it makes you go more slowly. Slower, right. It's all right. Read it two or three times. That's okay. Yeah. Exactly. It's okay. But it's just important that you do it. So. Exactly. That's good. And do you have any of the books that you, uh, you already mentioned some of the books that you want, you'd like to begin with. Um, uh, would any other particular books that you think people need to make sure they get? Um, one of my favorite books is Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence uh, by um, Father uh, St. Baptist de Jour. I, uh, these yeah. French names I can never remember. Yeah, but, yeah. And also written with St. Claude de Colombier. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing book. Mine has rubber bands around it because it's all falling apart. I've read it so many times. Right. That is in, you would read that in year four, um, which is The Life of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Another of my favorite books that is in this program is uh, Journal of a Soul by Pope John the Twenty Third. Amazing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's beautiful. And, and you know, a lot of times I hear people say so that to me it sounds silly. Where they'll say, Oh, I'm a John the Twenty Third Catholic, not a John Paul the Second. And I <laughs> makes me wonder. Did they actually ever read right. Journal of a Soul? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I tend to, something makes me suspicious that they haven't. Well, and reading that book gave me hope, you yeah. know, because you can see his transformation from the time he was a teenager yes. until, you know, the last years of his papacy. It's a beautiful transformation. A one, one it's thing one of becoming ever deeper in his faith. Oh, it's yeah. not just great sinner to saint, but it's, a deepening. And he always had a desire. Mm -hmm. So he, he laid out in the very beginning, I, you know, I showed this to my kids right away when I first had the book years ago. You know, he had, um, he had a list of things he wanted to do every day, every month, every year to grow in his faith. And he would check back and see how, you know, the kind of progress he was making. Um, one thing he struggled with a lot was praying the rosary. Mm -hmm. And I could identify with that. You know, I yeah. never prayed the rosary until I became a Catholic. And, you know, he would really, he, in his journal, he would say, I'm really struggling, Lord, with this rosary. I'm having a hard time. I couldn't focus today. Please help me focus better tomorrow. And you'd see that throughout the journal. And then you get to toward the end and you just see that gradually change. And then here he writes these beautiful meditations for the rosary yeah. as, as the Pope. So, I mean, just, it's a beautiful book. I think everyone and should read it. That brings up another point though. He gave that to us as his spiritual journal mm -hmm. is Keeping a journal helpful in this whole process? Absolutely. Um, when I read, I read with a highlighter and a pen and a journal. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I think you definitely need to be highlighting what you're reading so you can come back and, you know, just digest it some more. Just keep those important pieces in mind. Mm -hmm. um, I do keep a spiritual reading journal and I strongly recommend it for everyone. Um, and, and I begin every, every entry with Dear Lord, you know, so I know it's not, this is not about self-help. It's not about pouring out your feelings and analyzing, <laughs> you know, your psychology, your psychological situation. It's not like, you know, we post all our emotions on Facebook or social media or things like, you know, we've become a culture that's so focused on the self. I think some people who want to grow in their spiritual life are a little nervous about the idea of a spiritual journal, but it's not that. This is about developing a relationship with our Lord. When you re did you include St. Augustine's Confessions? Yes. Yeah. Because that's what he does mm -hmm. in the Confessions. It's a prayer. Yeah. His, his book is a prayer to our Lord, mm -hmm. and that's what a journal ought to be. A, a conversation yes. that's part of a relationship with Christ. Right, right. And yeah. that's, that's extremely important. Part. And that's what spiritual reading helps you do as well. So. Um, you know, St. Jerome used to say, when we, when we pray, we speak to God, but when we read, He speaks to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the spiritual reading and then also with this journal, journaling combined with that, it really opens up a conversation and a relationship yeah. uh, that's very important. And I oftentimes think, you know, because I, I like to um, underline, I don't have a highlight, but I underline with a pen. Right. Because I also write notes and that my margins yep. are filled with notes. Um, but when whether it's scripture or a spiritual book, when certain things jump out to me, mm -hmm. that's when I think that the Holy Spirit is doing His kind of highlighting right. and wants me to focus on that passage. I may have read it a thousand times, right. Right. but a certain moment He highlights that in order for me to focus on that. And, and I ought to therefore highlight it and write right. with, with And sometimes you're surprised probably by what it is that, yeah. that you know, you pull out of there. So uh, exactly. yeah, I think that's true as well. So um, yeah, and that's an important point to make too, is that this is not just me reading. This is, you know, you unite yourself to the Holy Spirit. You ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in your reading process so that it becomes um, you know, a way to unite ourselves with Christ as opposed to just this intellectual effort to, to understand. Um, I, I think, like you said, they both need to really go together. Yeah, exactly. That's because one of the goals of spiritual life, and as a matter of fact, this is one of the th things that spiritual life does for people that unbelievers don't get, mm -hmm. that the spiritual life integrates all the different aspects of one's life, right. including the aspects we like least of about ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's why confession is so important, right. that you confess your sins, but you're owning up responsibility that the sinful stuff is part of me too. Right. Yep. And not just the positive self-image that, yes, I can do this. Right. No, that, right, that, it's not, I'm okay, you're okay, you know, no. right, not, absolutely not. Yeah, sometimes I'm so-so at best, Yeah, you yeah. Know, not even and, okay. And that's something it does, it really keeps yourself in check, you know, right. I mean, spiritual reading really does that, so. Yeah. yeah, we had a coffee mug at one of our communities that said, I'm okay, you're okay, he's kind of so-so. <laughs> <laughs> he needs some help, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But it's, it, it is an important element that, um, we, we allow God to integrate all these things. When people talk about being, you know, Christians are hypocrites, what you're talking about is sometimes it's hard to integrate the darker sides, the sinful sides, mm -hmm. but part of the process of growing in the spiritual life is that we eventually learn to let Christ bring that integration of all aspects, intellectual, emotional, moral, immoral, everything. Right. We have to take a little bit of a break. Okay. So we're gonna do that now, and then we're gonna come back, and we hope that you have some questions, and our studio audience may have some questions, so please stay with us.
welcome back. Well, first of all, I want to invite you to come and join us here. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the weather's very nice. Uh, we'd love to have you come and join us. And if you can, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to EWTN.com and they will give information on the scheduling of masses here at the, the uh, network. Also, uh, shows where you can be in our audience. They'll give you directions up to Hansville. You can go pray with the sisters. And they'll let you know some good places to stay and eat, because they have a lot of good food over here. You ready for some questions? I think so. Well, sure. you're going to give some answers? We'll give let's, it a shot. Let's try it out. Let's start with Brian. Hello, Brian. How you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Where are you calling from? Washington, D.C. Well, aren't you something? And what is your question or comment? I'd like to make a comment. I've been watching this show for the last couple of years. Uh -huh. It led me to become Catholic. Is that I'm right? I'm going to be baptized on Saturday. Oh, and wonderful. I just want to say God bless you, Ms. Pop Ms. Oh, You are definitely a man of God. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm honored that uh, this has been a help to you. Uh, did you have any religious background before this? Um, I, was, I did believe in Jesus, and I was Protestant, but I, I just tried to read the Bible, but the Catholic Church definitely made everything clear when I went to RCIA. Well, that's fantastic. And, and I hope, Brian, that the longer you're Catholic, uh, you, watch, watch this happening in the next month or two, that you'll say, wait a minute, you'll, a lot of people experience this great joy, not unlike Jesus at the baptism when the, his, the Holy Spirit came down on him, the Father spoke, and then he was tempted, right? You may experience some of that, and I, I say that not just for you, Brian, but for all the catechumens, because I hear about that, but don't, don't worry about that. That's not, oh, maybe I made a mistake. No, it's a temptation, and you'll have that, you know, maybe in the next month or two afterwards, and you just work through that, and then uh, you'll, you'll see that the living out of the faith is always more and more interesting. Well, welcome to the church, and I'll be praying for you on Holy Saturday, Brian. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, God bless you. God bless you. Let's take a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you calling from? Oh, you, you've called, you're right here in the studio audience. You, I made you shut off your phone. Where are you from? I'm from Texas, uh, Victoria, Texas. Ain't you something. And what is your question? Well, um, I was a uh, confirmation CCD teacher a few years back. I had a student who was actually, was, I was a sponsor also, and I just saw on Facebook that he had posted that he's so glad that he is now reading Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins and that he's now seen the light. And two things, one is, you know, where did I mess up? And, and number two is, is there a reading list or something that I could send or, so, you know, what can, what can be done? Good. Um, well, no, that's a lot of parents have the same question. Uh, how old is this young person? Probably a sophomore in college now, maybe. Yeah, yeah. and and Prime time. I'll bet he got some of that from professors, not unlike your professor. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. But let's. What do you have to say to that? Yeah. In fact, I have a niece who's coming into the church Saturday, and she gave me an amazing story about a professor who, uh, you know, asked her many things in private about her faith, and really. The things that she said made me think, had, she, had this professor been a Christian and my niece been an atheist, that professor would have been out of, job, out of a job in two seconds flat. Yeah. You know, she really said, you can believe Jesus is a teacher, but you don't have to believe that he's God. You know, she said things like this to her in the private. The professor? The teacher, yeah, at a community college. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not surprised at all that, that this young man has had this, this problem or this question. Um, and believes that he's found an alternative truth. Uh, we read uh, Seeds of the Word by Bishop Barron not too long ago on spiritualdirection.com, and he has several essays in there where he does address um, atheists, you know, Dawkins and Hitchens, and he says, you know, we as Catholics, we need to be able to articulate our faith as well as they can articulate their arguments because they are 
really able to, you know, grab hold of these young people and people are, people are biting. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting back, not out there teaching, you know, the ability to articulate all the truths of our faith. Mm -hmm. And we really need to do that. And yeah, as far as our reading list, um, Father McCloskey's Lifetime Catholic Reading List, I have a book right here with several, um, uh, several book lists as well, so. Yeah, well, one, one of the books I would recommend for you as a catechist and to challenge this student, to challenge this young man, there's a absolutely wonderful book uh, called The Last Superstition. And this is by Dr. Edward Facer. He's a professor of philosophy. Mm -hmm. I believe, last I heard he was at Loyola Marymount in uh, Los Angeles area. And F Dr. Facer's book is a superb presentation of how to use reason mm -hmm. to come to the understanding of the human soul mm -hmm. and the existence of God. Um, you know, I was a philosophy major, but that book gave the clearest exposition of why the pre-Socratic philosophers set the stage for the most important questions for us to deal with, mm -hmm. Thales and the others, that these, that they posed questions. They didn't have any good answers, mm -hmm. but they had excellent questions that then he shows how Plato and then Aristotle and especially Thomas Aquinas comes up with ways to understand mm -hmm. why it, uh, the last superstition is atheism. Okay. And that, you know, thinking mm -hmm. makes it so clearly obvious that God exists. And he specifically takes on Dawkins and Hitchens et al. Uh, okay. to deal with their arguments showing that they use fake arguments. Okay. and that their arguments are not solidly thought out. It's not good logic. Mm -hmm. he, it's not that he just doesn't like him. Now, I also would add, you know, I, I, uh, for me with Hitchens, God rest his soul, uh, I pray for him often. His brother's a com very committed Christian. Right. Um, but uh, one of the uh, th things that boggled my mind but shows the mentality of atheism at its extreme. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book and did a documentary claiming that Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, mm -hmm. was the most wicked person of the 20th century. Yeah. Now think about that. Her com competition included Adolf <laughs> Hitler, Adolf Eichmann, right. Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, so and she won the prize yeah. <laughs> as the most wicked compared to all them in Hitchens' mind. Wow. And I say, if you <laughs> can see that Mother Teresa is more wicked than Mao Zedong or uh, uh, Stalin, right? Um, there may be something wrong in your basic assumptions about so. life. <laughs> have to wonder. So, and, and ask your friend about that. Ask him, you know, say, do you think that Mother Angelica is, or Mother Angelica, Mother Teresa is the most wicked person that ever lived in the 20th century? That'd be a good question. Let's see what he says. And then point out that his hero came up with that notion. Let's take another question. We have Nancy on the line. Nancy, yes. where, where are you calling from? Father, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Aren't you something? That's a nice town. So what is your question? Okay, Father, I watch your show quite often. Thank you. I hear about all your wonderful books that you write. Vicki here has a wonderful book that I would love to get my hands on. Here's the problem, Father. I had cerebral palsy. Uh, my eyesight's not that great either. But mm -hmm. my brain, it doesn't, I can't read. I retain sound. I retain sure. picture. Sure. Why can't we ever have audio books? 
Yeah, why can't we have audio books? You got the list. What's wrong with that? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. I, I, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, Nancy, the answer is marketing. Hmm. That's the problem. The expense of putting a book to audio. If you notice, Nancy, even bestsellers don't always come out as audio. Now, hmm. Raymond Arroyo mm -hmm. was able to get his biography of Mother Angelica on audio. But none of my publishers have done that. Now, I think, I, I, th I think you've got a very excellent point, Nancy. Um, you know, but it, 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 the problem is, could we get it marketed? And maybe with things like, uh, you know, uh, MP3 and other digital formats that are less expensive than uh, CDs. Okay we may be able to do something. But that is an excellent, excellent question. And, um, you know, we may need to talk to our publishers some more. Well, and I don't know the quality, but I do think on a Kindle, can't you listen to a book? I don't know. In audio on a Kindle, I think. I, I don't know. I don't listen to audio books much, but I do think I was able to do that yeah, one time. Yeah, I, 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 I like paper. I yeah, yeah, So I don't, I don't have too. a Kindle, and I don't know if I want one. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, the books that I read are probably not available. Yeah. <laughs> I read geeky books. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, where are you from? Father, I'm from Skillman, New Jersey. Good to have you here. Welcome. And thank what you is your much. question? Well, first, thank you very much for this program. I've watched it for many years. I've always found it to be very helpful and very informative. Thank and, you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Vicki, for uh, this talk that you've had uh, for us today. Um, as I listen to you uh, and talk about, you know, reading your way to heaven, uh, intellectually it makes very good sense to me. Uh, I do read a fair amount, uh, um, and uh, but I guess the challenge is how do you get it from your head to your heart? How do you actually read the the information that we're talking about, the scriptures, and 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 have it internalized? Have it move from your head down into your heart. How do you get the quiet time maybe to do that? Are there any tips or, tips or tricks you can give? Uh, yeah, I think, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one thing I recommend is definitely setting aside time and a, a quiet place to read, to do your reading, so that it is done in a prayerful manner. Um, for me, it was many years before I really felt like I was growing spiritually I mean it was an intellectual trip first but but I mean I think that that is a process whereby you learn and over time you know the Holy Spirit does speak to your heart so um, I made time when you know when I read something that gave recommendations for example I began to go to adoration more often you know I, I would read and I would try to take those um, take those pieces of advice to heart and the more I went to adoration, the more I really felt, you know, that Christ is present there and that he, that it became more of a relationship as opposed to an intellectual endeavor. Mm -hmm. and, and I think really just pouring out, um, pouring out the actions of my faith. As, I mean, I know I heard Archbishop Fulton Sheen talk about a young man who um, his father was having a really hard time with him. And Archbishop Sheen told him, send him to Mexico to this uh, he had him sent to a school, uh, this teenager who was really rebellious. And when he sent him, the son came back completely changed because he said, you know, you open your heart to serve others. You need to open your heart to give. And sometimes you don't do that willingly. But over time, the young man learned and came back a changed man. And, and somehow he had had an encounter with Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of it is actually trying to live out the things that we're reading in our everyday life. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, uh, uh, I would highlight what you just said, that that time before the Blessed Sacrament, a lot of people, you know, the, the movement to pray a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament has grown a lot. I'd love to encourage that. Yeah, yeah. And taking time to read slowly and pray, again, like a Godiva chocolate, you savor it. Mm -hmm. Those are too expensive to just chunk down, you know. Right. So yeah. you got to take each one and eat slowly and just 
let let the different the flavors come and do the same with spiritual reading right yeah letting our the, the holy spirit speak to your heart right through the, again it nourishes your intellect but it also speaks to your heart to understand more deeply right well and there are ways that you can approach your reading as well i know i do talk about lexio divina and there you know there are meditations what, what does that can, mean lexio divina uh, honestly like divine reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, I use uh, information from Dan Burke's book uh, about prayer um, to talk about, to really explain the process of Lexio Divina. It really is a prayerful way of meditating on scripture, you know, to, uh, placing yourself in, you know, in the time and the place where this was, these words were written and really pouring yourself into, um, into the, into the, the scriptures mm -hmm. and really slowly contemplating um, the position, the place, the sen you know, pouring all your senses into your reading and, and you know, seeing what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and, and it does become a conversation uh, rather than just a matter of reading. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are, other, there are other methods as well, but uh, that's the one that we uh, described yeah. here. Now, one other thing I want to make sure that we cover before we, we would end tonight, you do have the spiritual reading club Mm -hmm. what, 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 tell, how does somebody get a hold of that? What is, well, first of all, what is it? Spiritualdirection.com. Okay. Uh, it is, it's a website, and several years ago, I started uh, my own spiritual reading book club. I moved to a new place, didn't know a lot of people, and I thought, you know, I had done several book clubs in person uh, where we'd lived before, and so I thought, I'm going to start a spiritual reading book club online so people can check in and check out, you know, at their leisure. And just a few months into it, um, Father McCloskey uh, had me hook up with Dan Burke and I spoke with him and he had started spiritualdirection.com. So he invited me to take uh, this book club onto his website, which was growing exponentially at the time. Mm -hmm. And it just was a great fit. So we've been doing it for about five years now. Excellent. Uh, Sarah Reinhardt is my partner in crime, so to speak. And we, you know, we'll take a book and spend many weeks on it. And uh, you know, right now we're reading Our Lady of Fatima in honor of the hundredth anniversary, sure. and I think we're taking eight weeks to read that book. So you know, you can check in there anytime and and join us. Yeah, it's a spiritualdirection.com mm -hmm. as a place to to get in on that. Do you read out loud or discuss books? Well, the way it works is we have an assignment every week mm -hmm. that we post, and then what we do uh, with respect to the reading is, I will take a quote that really struck me when I was mm -hmm. reading. And then we'll talk about it as though, you know, if you're in a book club in person, generally people sit around and, you know, this really spoke to me because it made me think of X, Y, and Z, you know, this situation in my family or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It really speaks to you in a personal way. And so I'll take a quote and then I will just write a post that has something to do with, you know, it could be our country, it could be our family life, could be, you know, whatever's going on at the time, how this piece of this work kind of fits our, our daily lives, or, you know, our lives today. And until we can get some of these books put on CD or, you know, aud as audio books and such, mm -hmm. Nancy, who called earlier, uh, want you to maybe try that. That might be one place where you can get some of that. Yeah, and then uh, you just, the comment box is just where people come in and right. make their own okay. contributions. So. Let's uh, go to another caller. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Father Mitch. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, where are you from? I'm from New York City. Yeah, it didn't take me long to figure that out. I can tell <laughs> from your accent. So what, what is your question, Dennis? Well, Father Mitch, you are a gift from God. And Vicki, you are one of the most beautiful women I've seen on TV, <laughs> including Melania, when oh. she <laughs> prays the Our Father. Oh, and nice. My question is, when your children were in second, third, and fourth grade, which catechism did you use to teach them the faith? Oh, so, uh, so what do you use for your children? The St. Joseph First Communion Catechism. St. Joseph First Communion Catechism. Yep. Does that have stages after First Communion? Yep, there are different volumes. So we go through the First Communion Catechism, then there's volume one and volume two. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really we go through, we memorize the questions and answers, we read each chapter, we discuss it. There are, you know, questions and discussions and 
um, things you can go through there. So it's very thorough and beautiful. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, th that that's a good catechism. Have you ever used the UCAT with your teenagers? My son does have that. Yeah, and he read it all the time when he first got it. Um, okay. My 16-year-old, I think he was probably 14 when he received, oh, probably for confirmation, mm -hmm. and he read it quite a bit then. Um, my eight-year-old right now is fascinated by the little flip person, honey. You know, the little guy who, if you use it as a flip book, there's a little guy at the bottom of the UCAT that does a the oh. somersaults through the. Yeah, so my eight-year-old oh, plays I, with it quite yeah, a bit right I, I now, but he hasn't read it much. I haven't <laughs> you haven't seen that. Done that. <laughs> oh, you have to pick one up. They're kind of fun. <laughs> oh. That's good. Uh, well, I also just want to mention you. You have a blog. Pelican's Breast. Uh, What's that? Well, the idea is that a mother pelican would, you know, if her young were starving, she would peck her own breast and feed them her blood, and that became a symbol for of Christ, Christ, right? right. Um, that and that story point. is, you know, ancient, um, but it's become a symbol of Christ. And one thing that really came up often in our spiritual direction discussions is the notion of sacrifice. When we write about sacrifice, it was one of the most popular topics because we have this really challenging relationship with it. We really admire people who do it who offer, um, you know, if, if we meet someone who has had a great tragedy and they meet it with, you know, joy and beauty and love, we strongly admire that, but we want no part of having to do that, or, you know, having to, to suffer or make any sacrifices ourselves, you know, so the sacrifices... Or to are, understand the suffering that we are going through. Right. That may not be something we choose. Right. But we can offer that up to God. And too. we all have it and we don't want any part of it. Right. But from afar, we, we think it, you know, it's um, the way people handle sacrifices, um, the way people offer their suffering as a sacrifice yeah. is beautiful. So, so uh, I started a blog on that and it's just just a discussion about sacrifice in daily life, you know, in family life. Um, and as a country, we did a lot regarding the, you know, during the campaign, uh, sure. just as a country, what we go through as well. All right, so the book is How to Read Your Way to Heaven, a spiritual reading program for the worst of sinners and the greatest of saints and everyone in between. Uh, and v Vicki Burback is also available at uh, that book is available at EWTNRC.com, our catalog, or you can call them 1-800-854-6316, item number 82360. Thank you, Vicki, for being here. It's Thank a busy you. time and uh, for our family and all. We love having you here, and it's a great gift, so appreciate it very Thank much. You. And. Also, something, um, speaking of sacrifice and all, last Sunday, uh, horrible bombings of Coptic Christians as they were celebrating Palm Sunday. This year, the Orthodox and the Catholic uh, celebration of Easter is on the same uh, day and such. And this was a, a horrible suffering. And of course, we're aware of the children that, and, and other people that were bombed with gas in uh, Syria. Um, I want to pray for all of them. But uh, in particular, we need to remember, uh, especially for us Christians, keep in mind how much the Coptic Christians and other Christians in the Middle East are being martyred, that their sacrifices of their own blood, they are united with Christ on the cross when that goes on. So do keep them in your prayers. And I want to bestow my blessing on you that you might have a wonderful, wonderful triduum beginning tomorrow, Holy Thursday and Good Friday, Holy Saturday and Easter. Go to the services and in, enter into the mysteries. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Again, we can bring you Vicki and all the other guests that we have here on television only because this network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and even some of those candy egg bills, and we will be able to pay for our bills too. God bless you, and thank you.